right, welcome everyone. My name is Samantha Daywalt and I'm the Managing Director of the Lehigh at NASDAQ Center, a collaboration between Lehigh University and the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center in San Francisco. The NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potential. As their academic and residence partner, Lehigh is passionate about developing the next generation of global entrepreneurial leaders, innovators, and change makers. Together, we're designing high impact immersive learning experiences to support entrepreneurial talent development for students and the startup community. We are thrilled to be partnering with the NASDAQ Center on a new course this semester, uh, which explores the global innovation ecosystem and its diverse investors, entrepreneurs, nonprofits, public policies, and cultures. We'd like to welcome the 22 Lehigh students who are participating in the Investing in Innovation course, who are joining us today, along with their professor, Jessica Strauss. And thank you to the students for submitting some really fantastic questions for the fireside discussion today with Nicola Corzine and Julie Wainwright. So we will open up for live Q&A at the end of the event. So please submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. So during these really unique times, the NASDAQ Center is curious how sentiment is among the entrepreneurs in our community. We would like to start by launching a poll to understand how you are feeling about your business right now. So the first question, how are you feeling? Fearful, anxious, surviving, optimistic? All right, well, this is a great turnout. About 46% say optimistic, followed by anxious. So that's to be expected, but, but optimistic is good. All right, so our next question, what is keeping you up at night? Is it finance, sales, marketing, scale, pivot, team, or just surviving? All right, the results are in. So surviving 31% followed by finance at, at 29%. All right, well, thank you for sharing. So thanks for participating in those polls. And without any further delay, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our host for the afternoon, Nicola Corzine, Executive Director of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center and our very special guest, Julie Wainwright, founder and CEO of The Real Real. Sam, thank you so much. And Julie, it is an incredible treat to have you with us today, especially with everything going on in the world right now and always with Real Real. Thanks for finding the time. This is going to be an amazing conversation, and we're truly delighted to be able to host it with you today. Um, so let's get started with perhaps um, a truth statement and also a little bit of an inspiration statement for me personally, for sure. You uh, have founded one of the most impactful and inspiring companies in the world right now, I, easy to say. Um, tell me a little bit about how this journey unfolded for you um, to bring you to starting Real Real. Oh gosh, well, there's so many things. Um, so first of all, to all the would-be um, entrepreneurs listening, uh, the students, one of the things that uh, I wish I would have done, to be honest, earlier was start a company earlier. And I was really, I was always the CEO they brought in that's, you know, the hired gun. And I was getting, I always, as I went through my career, I was getting really jealous of entrepreneurs. And I thought, you know what, you can't get jealous about anything. If you can change things, what that means is I needed to become an entrepreneur. So without a doubt, I needed to do it. But then I'm like, okay, then you have to say, well, what, cause you don't want to, yeah, then I had to say, well, what do I want to do? Much harder. I already knew I wanted to go into e-commerce again or a marketplace environment. And I was, had been studying Amazon. So think about 10 years ago and been very close to Amazon. In fact, they were one of the first investors and single biggest investors in pets.com where I was the CEO. So I'd been watching them early on and I had it all mapped out where they were really good, where they were really bad, how you compete. And I had 
and then I and then areas that would be really hard for them to ever win in. And I had no ideas, but I had this really a, a map that was literally written down map of all of these opportunities, this and that. And then like any good idea, um, I was shopping with someone and the idea, <laughs> I've said this many times, but it's a true story. I'm shopping with a friend in a full price boutique that has a little bit of consignment in the back and that's where she spent her money. And she would never walk in a consignment store. She would never would shop on eBay. She thought it's a pain, it was too hard, too many fakes. And yet given the chance between full retail and beautiful, uh, full retail, contemporary but still nice brands versus consignment previously owned um, luxury brands that's where she spent her money and I thought okay then when we walked out of the store I asked her a whole bunch of questions and at that moment it sent me on a journey to explore how big is this luxury market worldwide in the U.S. What is what is the competitive set looking like to resell them and it was pretty bad it's you know, it was like pawn shops for fine jewelry and watches. Um, it's uh, consignment stores, corner consignment stores that were, you know, could be really nice mom and pop businesses, but they weren't aggregating the power of an audience and they, and they couldn't authenticate and they weren't using data to set their prices. So there's a lot of things that um, the internet could offer, technology could offer that they weren't going to get. And then there's, you know, eBay, which is great for peer to peer. So that was my original competitive set. And I just ran as fast as I could, but it really was already, I had, a, I knew where I wanted to go sort of, I love hearing the cash register ring every moment. So I knew <laughs> I wanted to get back in a marketplace. Um, my strength is B to C. And uh, then it was more of like, how do you create a winning business that's big? Oh, and I also want, I wanted to do something that I thought could scale to multiple billion dollars. So, you know, you have that, but that, you know, you can, you can have all these constructs and then you have no ideas. So it took about probably about three months after I had all the constructs really clear in my head for the idea to come into fruition and then about another three months for me to research it, put together a business plan, raise some money, some seed money, and hire a person. Amazing. Well, you know, I, I, I think from that moment of impact and that dear friend that kind of got those wheels turning um, to, the, to the success that is Real Real today, it's just been an amazing journey. But obviously, like with all amazing journeys, it, it doesn't start necessarily being amazing from the get-go. I'm sure there were days that were incredibly hard. And, and, and I think 2020, for all of our entrepreneurs right now, there's been some incredibly hard days for all of us. What, what were those early days like for you? And then maybe to the extent that you can share, what helped keep you going when those struggles were real? Well, look, I didn't do this when I was a kid. So I did it in my early 50s. So if you think about, so you're, I would say the beauty of doing it, so I was 52 when I started the business. And the beauty of that, I didn't have competing pressures, meaning I didn't, I wasn't trying to raise a family and then I wasn't trying to find my life's mate by then. Um, I wasn't, uh, so you, sort of like, I knew what I was really good at. I knew I, what I wasn't good at. So a lot of things that could really derail uh, just because you, you know, it's hard to start a company. And when you start a company, you have to give your all and other things have to be, you have to make a choice. If I do this, I won't have time to do this. So I was very clear about the trade-offs and very comfortable. And that's the beauty of doing it with, when you're older. The downside of doing it with you're older, I mean, you're working 75, 80 hours a week. And so there were times when I would, and I rented a small place to get started, I would come home at night, answer customer service calls, uh, you know, take care of whatever I needed to at home and fall asleep on the kitchen, not even on the table, on the bar, the kitchen bar, you know, <laughs> like in a tall seat. And I'm like, I can just, I mean, and I, so it was more about keeping focused on proving the business model, keeping the energy up. I never thought it would fail. So, I mean, and I, um, and I think that's, it's an entrepreneurial trait. It's also, I had a lot of uh, rails around to make sure I wasn't believing my own press. So I really knew it was going to succeed, but it was running the business and figuring out the model. And then a year, it took about a year to raise 
venture capital. I thought I, I really waited about a year before I raised institutional money because I wanted to have everything together. I knew it would be a hard concept. And then raising capital was always hard. I mean, every entrepreneur gets more no's than yeses. Um, I think uh, females get a lot more no's. And when you have a really novel concept, uh, it's harder for VCs to wrap their head around it. Believing in the possible is uh, always part of selling the dream. And I, and I think you've done an amazing job at that. It, it, and, and equally inspiring, I think, to realize that you lent on that experience that you had, not just with Pets.com, but it, it, in other environments from your career as well. Can you maybe share a little bit about how some of those experiences translated into sort of accelerated learning, if you will, for real, real or applications that made sense there, Julie? Well, one of the things I think is really hard for most entrepreneurs, because you generally have to really, you do have to believe in yourself more than anyone else does. Otherwise, you wouldn't walk out the door. You have to believe in your idea is then to learn how to read the data so you're not fooling yourself. So I gave myself, I, um, I thought I will know within five months of starting this company, A, if I can scale it, B, you know, um, if people are really interested in this concept because it's so different. And I set up really hard metrics to measure. So they were internal metrics, but they were stretch goals. And um, I think that's one of the key things you always have to do as an entrepreneur. You have to like not believe your own hype, although you have to always believe it. So you're always this divided being of being like incredibly positive, incredibly, uh, forthright, but then also incredibly pragmatic. And it's always hard, you know, it's the old, I think it was Kenny Loggins, you got to know when to hold them and when to fold them. <laughs> right. I don't know many entrepreneurs that know when to fold them. And so, oh, and, then I'll iter and then iterate. I mean, the last thing you want to do is like get to the end of a runway, uh, a time, usually it's money, and go, oops, I need to pivot. So we never pivoted, um, but we were, I was really regimented, but we iterated along the way, but we never did a hard pivot. That's really sage advice. Um, now speaking of sage advice, and, and, and we had the chance to sort of start this chat maybe even before everyone joining us today. If you could go back and give your younger self some advice, maybe coming straight out of college, um, what would it be? And, and, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm so glad you brought that up. So. Um, at the risk of trying to overgeneralize male versus female, um, I would say that I kept thinking as a um, person coming out of college, I needed more experience before I started a company. I've always wanted to start a company. I needed more experience, more experience, more experience. And I am now, um, I, I personally have a scholarship program for my um, first young female would-be entrepreneurs out of my alma mater. And they're all like, no, I can't really start it right out of college. I got to get more experience, which was what was in my head. I can tell you being in Silicon Valley now for as long as I've been, which is, you know, over 30 years, I haven't met one male entrepreneur that thought that way. They're like, I'm just going to do it. I'll learn it on the job. And so I think for, for me personally, I wish, while well, all my experience was good and it's certainly additive, I wish I would have just taken the leap and not worried about it because you do learn a lot. On, and if you're, you, you learn so much when you, when you jump over off the edge there and say, I'm going to make something that no one's done before and I can do it. And you're going to fail a lot and you're going to make mistakes. Um, but the learning you get doing your own company is invaluable. So I would have said stop because I had all these different businesses. I wanted, I thought about wanting to start from a very early age. My, it helps that my father was an entrepreneur. And so, you know, you look at it and, you're, and I just didn't do it. I didn't do it until I thought, you know what, I am, Silicon Valley is hard on women and it's hard on people over the 40. And I thought, you know what, this is, so what that means is I've got to create the job I want to spend the rest of my career doing. Mm -hmm. And so almost until I sort of put like, uh, I was dealt with the realities of ageism combined with sexism in the Valley, where I just said, this is my time. What am I doing? I'm like, I got to psych myself into it, not psych myself out. This is my time. But I would have said to my younger self, just do it. It's <laughs> great. 
It's awesome. All right. So for those amazing female and male founders who are just doing it, they've taken that first step forward. What advice would you give to them, those that are just starting out right now? You've given us some wonderful things already to start with, right? Always being curious, making sure that you're not waiting to the end to make shifts and adjustments. But what other advice do you think has has helped shape some of the great companies that you've worked with Slime? Um, I'd say there's a couple of big things. Know your own personal strengths and weaknesses and what the business needs. So hire for the gaps. Mm-hmm. And um, it's really critical because you're going to, it's really hard to think about bringing someone else in. You may or may not need a co-founder. I know everyone was big on co-founders. I'm like, eh, maybe you need one, maybe you don't. But hire for the gaps in your own skill set. The other thing is, sadly, it's all about raising money. You have to always be raising money. Even when you don't want to raise capital, you've got to always be raising money. I raise money for every six months for the last nine years. And actually, I think, yeah, nine years because we raised money during COVID also. So you're always raising capital. And so you, if you don't want some ideas take a little longer, most should show some really good sign of life within six months. But when you think about what raising capital means, always raising, it means you have to move, you have to always raise, but you have to show results. So let's say you raise a little bit of seed to get series A, you have to take in that money, pick the high order bit and how you're going to utilize that capital to show results to convince the next set of investors that, yeah, you're really on to something. So that's also critical. Can't be shy of the fundraising or or selling in any regard. Um, you know, when you look back maybe a little bit on on both pets.com and, and, and clearly real real, are there a couple of lessons or maybe even a couple of principles that stand out to you, Julie, as really having contributed to the overarching success that your trajectory has taken off with? It's all about timing. So, you know, people always like, what's your big lesson from Pets? Pets was an incredibly well-run company, but it's about timing. And look at Chewy.com. Chewy.com is Pets.com. There isn't anything they're doing. In fact, Pets.com was doing more. We had subscription. We had private label. We had... um, We had all pets. We also had our own magazine, our own experts. So pets.com is sort of reborn is chewy.com. So that, why did it work? Well, when pets.com was started, there were only 200 million people in the world doing on the internet. When chewy.com was started, everyone transacted. So that's one thing. Number two, I mean, so timing's everything with the real, real timing. We really were coming out of 2008, a recession, um, which meant people had a huge financial hit and they were looking for smarter ways to actually recoup some of their own investments. And it could be in fashion or their home goods or whatever. And secondarily, and it didn't, it started a little late, maybe 12, 2012, 13, the environmental impact of positive environmental impact of recirculating goods was getting awareness. So I would say that as the, that is all timing with, with the real, 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 real really is one of the best environmentally, what was sound ways to positively impact the environment by buying recirculated goods. So, and we were really big on sustainability from the beginning, but people didn't want to hear about that at the beginning. And now it's a key deciding factor on do they consign and do they buy previously owned goods? So, but that environmental impact along with the misfortunes and the feeling of um, loss during 2008 sort of set the way for a value-driven luxury business that is also sustainable. And that's, that's really where the real world sits, to be honest. Yeah, you know, timing is, is, is definitely one of those avenues where I think paying attention to the cues and, and leaning in when you see those cues present themselves to identify that model, bring it forward, is something that you're definitely well known for now. Um, you, it, Julie, you shared already earlier, get used to the word no, unfortunately, a lot in the trajectory and the journey of an entrepreneur. Um, in, in some ways, easy to say, uh, and in other words, really hard to say too, because it feels personal in many ways, the entrepreneurs 
ideas are their own children, their own their own joys, their own hopes for the world. How do you deal with adversity to the extent that you can share any sort of tactics or, or helpful hints as to how you deal with that word no coming up a lot? So, I mean, first of all, you gotta, when you're out meeting with venture capitalists, every single person you meet gives you good feedback. May not be what you wanna hear, but they all give you good feedback. It could be simply, you're not telling your story crisply enough. It could be they're worried about X, Y, and Z. So you're constantly listening. I'm not saying you change your pitch, but you're aware of reasons that you've given them or the market's given them or their own experience that has given them to say no. So then you have to treat every no as an opportunity to, to learn and to listen. And it's all good, especially fast no's. You hate anything fast, yes or no is great. Slow no's, consider a slow no a no. So if you don't get a yes or a no, it's a no, but it's all good information. And the other thing is, Companies, you don't want someone on your early and as an early investor that is not sure, that really doesn't buy into your um, dream. Because if they don't, stuff always goes wrong, or maybe your timing's off, or you require more capital. I mean, there's always nuances, or maybe their fund is requiring them to be more. Uh, you know, they have to show a bigger return. So they're putting pressure on you. So if you have anyone that comes in and isn't your ally in building that business, or they come in and they're, you know, maybe 60, 40, as an entrepreneur, you need someone on your side and someone who really buys into it, not questioning you. So I would say that um, ultimately, if you pers- if you really persevere and you will get the right investors and those investors should be people that see you out and you don't want those other people, but the other people that have said no are giving you good information. Uh, the learnings that come from those no's can be incredible, we know. Uh, it, you have, um, I mean, real, real success, 11 rounds now, I think, if, 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 if I'm if doing well, my part of capital, it's absolutely remarkable, 2000 employees. Um, and the journey to IPO, uh, but again, not linear, I'm sure. Tell us a little bit more about like what that experience at the IPO was like for you and, and sort of some of those um, lessons that led up into knowing that that was the right strategy that you wanted to take the company on from a trajectory perspective. Sure, I mean, one of the things you have to remember when you do take outside investors, they're not like there to like make sure they're, they, they're, they need a return on their money. So there's two avenues at some point. And we took, you know, by the time we IPO'd, I think Canaan uh, Partners, the first institutional investor had money in us almost eight years. It's a long cycle. So um, you have a commitment to your investors to give them some form of liquidity. And there are two ways you either sell or, um, sell the company or you IPO. So let's just put that out there. If you take institutional money, it's not, you know, there are expectations and they will drive you to the expectations. Now, the question is when when do you do it? You sell or IPO? You never, you, hopefully you never sell under duress because you never get a good price. So you sell when you think you have the right partner to move the business into further. That doesn't happen that often. Usually if you have to sell, uh, it. Previously, it could be you're under duress, all right? So that's number one, um, but not always. I mean, you know, I don't think Instagram was under duress. I think they saw that, you know, Facebook might be a great partner for them um, and they have been. So that's that. And then the other thing, an IPO gives you liquidity. If you have the right checks and balances in the company, if you're used to running a tight financial company, um, if you have a team you believe can execute quarter and quarter, um, and it's a rigorous process, you know, post public to go through. So all of those things means that, you know, it's probably right. And then the markets have to be open. So there's that. So that, you know, but I would say you should be, pre- you should be prepared as a company. And then again, timing markets may not be open. So um, we, we timed it right. I'm very happy we went public. I think we have the rigors. I know we have the rigors internally to run a well-run company uh, for the investors that now invest in you have a new set of investors. And I'm really pleased that we did go public. And honestly, it was, 
you know, you have people that some people are still here and they've worked so hard. So for them personally to get some kind of financial reward beyond the meager salary, because we're not big payers, it's also good. It's good that, you know, you can help people who may have put their life on hold for six or seven years to have um, money in the bank, a little more cushion. And to be honest, to actually get some of the results of their hard work beyond, because it wasn't in salary, at least not at the real world, still not. Still not a, it's still not a, a company that pays big salaries. Well, we know though you care fundamentally about not just your employees, but talent in general. And obviously much of that can come from the form of mentorship. Um, we are passionate about the role of mentorship uh, at the center and, and equally, I know it matters to you. Tell us a little bit about how mentorship has, has maybe had an impact in your career uh, and certainly how you now pay it forward. We, we heard a little bit about some of the scholarship funds, but how else is mentorship impacting your world right now, Julie? So, I mean, this is a really interesting concept and I'd like to take it a little broader than most people do because there is... Um, and I have, a, I mean, there's some people that have made a big difference in my life without a doubt, and I'll talk about them. But I think the truth is, when you go on your journey, just as a human, you're going to be in a situation to learn from so many people in so many situations. And so I would say mentors don't, can be formal, but they don't have to be formal. And that you should look at the, take every opportunity to learn from someone's experiences uh, and really understand it without them like talking to you about it be, being a, be an observer be a great observer because mentors great mentors are everywhere um, during COVID for example I uh, you know I am an employer an employer in the state of California in the state of New Jersey in the state of New York and other states too but those three states re um, actually represent the most of my employees now for the first time ever, I became uh, sort of an observer of different leadership styles and from the government, from the governors, how different governors actually treated a crisis and how it impacted at least the business world and also the employees and me as a business owner who employs. And so I gained a lot of leadership tips on management and crisis just by observing. Now, having said that, um, I one of my favorite people who became a friend and a great mentor was Ann Wimblad. And Ann was one of the first female venture capitalists. She happened to be the woman I was shopping with. The day. Oh. I, I, yeah. So um, <laughs> she has a deeper ties into the real real. But she's, a, so she's an extraordinary person who's done extraordinary things and uh, gives really sound advice and easy to bounce things off of. So, you know, she's always been there and she's extraordinary, but, but there's extraordinary people I've met all throughout life that have actually shaped um, the way I look at things. I love that, absolutely love that. Yeah, it, going a little off script for a minute because I, I think people talk about this a lot, but sometimes it's really hard to, to know how to hone those skills. Talk us through how you hone the skills of observation because it's not always something that's taught in an environment that makes sense. What are some of those tricks that have made a difference to you in learning how to be a really good observer? Well, let me just bring it through here. This is really interesting. You know, it's always what people do, not what they say. But let's, I'm gonna take that and twist it a little to an observer as an entrepreneur. So one of the cool things is there's a lot of data about companies that get formed. And you can read about them, you can understand their premise, their competitive set. Um, and then what I've always done, and it's really fun to do it for me personally, is in my business to consumer space, I develop business theses about where they're gonna hit a wall, where they're gonna have to change, um, what, what the challenges are gonna be, how they're gonna compete. So I have this thesis for, again, my experience, my expertise as business to consumer. And, um, and then I sort of put it out there and then I track them to see was I right or wrong, right or wrong. And so on a, on a and that's really just, it's reading the data and observing, you know, really what they're doing. And I mean, you're always surprises, there's always surprises, but it, that honed your skill as a business person yeah. 
you know, it's like a little, I know it's a little nerdy for, but it's like, it's a fun pastime for me because I love, I love entrepreneurs so much. I want them all to succeed, <laughs> but I also, but clearly they won't. Most businesses don't succeed. So the, the question is, if I can learn from their success or failure, I'm going to incorporate it. And I do it through reading and observing how they act in a market. Uh, such great advice. And, and I think especially helpful for anyone uh, entering into emerging industries where you're looking almost at patterns from adjacent industries. So, so you can start to learn by others, even if it's not directly in that space. That's a fascinating, fascinating concept. Really good. Thanks, Julie. Um, now, obviously, you already talked a little bit about the criticality of um, sustainability and, and the importance of what Real Real does to those who are passionate about caring for our environment and for the world, and also just bringing more opportunity to value one's goods in different ways. Inside of now the public market, a lot of that is starting to get carried through from the consumer layer and that priority layer. What changes or shifts have you seen around sustainability in the last couple of years? And where do you see its trajectory kind of taking off in 21 and beyond? Well, gosh, there's so many different ways. The consumers are definitely voting with their dollars and they're hypersensitive. And the uh, millennials and Gen Z, sustainability is a critical reason on why they buy. Now, and so that's really, so you've got an audience that it, it, the, the world's changing and it's changing in a way of a deep awareness of we have to take care of the planet. That's great. Importantly, as a public company, investors are changing. So when they talk about um, ESG, so they really want to understand, you know, what is your plan for sustainability? What is your plan for diversity? What is your plan for holding your company and your employees and the executive team accountable on all of this? So investors are making public market and private market making decisions based on um, really different a set of values that may not have been in existence 10 years ago. They were there, but now it's they're becoming a force of investing. Love that. Now, before we go to uh, one of our last questions, before opening it up to the great questions that have been coming in both uh, earlier and live in chat. And as a reminder, if you have questions for Julie, now would be a great time to go ahead and pop, start popping them into the Q&A section. Um, I want to come back to this um, really intentional pull-up mechanism that you have for supporting women entrepreneurs, uh, those aspiring and those current. Um, how do you help provide support or what more do you think we can be doing in support of our female founders today? Oh, gosh. Well, first of all, um, uh, women get, and in it slipped, um, prior to COVID, they got 2.7% of all money, a venture capital money. So the first thing is for more female venture capitalists, because female venture capitalists tend to understand ideas that female entrepreneurs bring forward. So um, women just aren't getting the money. Uh, that's number one. And we got to change and we got to change the people giving the money, I mean, more female VCs will most likely get more funding. Um, the other thing is women have to know that other women made it. Everyone needs a role model. And once they think, well, if that person did it, I can do it, um, despite all odds. And there's some really good female um, role models out there. I mean, look, we've got Katrina Lake with Stitch Fix, which is awesome. And um, she comes to mind only because there are very few female founders that, have, that didn't have a male co-founder that took it from beginning to public. And she's one of them, I'm one of them. But you start looking around, there are women getting funded. So you go to them, you get inspired by them. You talk who funded them, how are they doing it? So those are all really important lessons. And the other thing, which um, there's a lot of good studies out now about bias against women um, when they're out with the venture capital, from the venture capitalists and how they treat women versus men. And I would say once you get uh, the Harvard Business School is one of my favorite ones that did where they were talking to the men about how big can you grow, how big is the opportunity, and to the, the young female entrepreneurs, they were talking about how fast can you get to profitability. 
So different, use different words, different. So I would say any studies that sensitize the venture capital community to their inherent biases, because we all have them, will also work to help support not just women, but people of color. Because they are, they are, there are some really good studies that point out these biases. And once you become aware of them, you can then strive to change it. But it comes down to more female VCs, more, uh, more showcasing women that have made it so women know they can make it. Um, and then making sure that the bias is inherent in the early stage capital, because you always have to be raising this. I said, you always need money. Um, they're aware of it. And the venture capital group has to have a pretty hard look at themselves and make efforts to change. And I think the big answer there is going to be their limited partners, because everybody answers to somebody in this world. They have limited partners. The limited partners have to hold the venture capital firms um, responsible for having a diverse portfolio, for um, having sustainability as a criteria in the companies they fund. So the LPs have to do their job. Uh, that's very, very, very sage advice, Julie. We've been uh, following and optimistic around seeing some early indications from family offices, certain types of LPs that are definitely influencers in that space. So hopefully in a handful of years, we'll be talking about that as being a problem of the past and not a problem for the future. Um, and so speaking of the future, my last question before we kind of roll into some of the great questions coming in from our audience, 10 years in the future, we have a, an, another amazing opportunity to sit down and connect with you. What will have shifted from your mind or what will have expanded as far as real, real success? What do you hope for future state for you personally, if you'll share, as well as real, real? Well, you know, we don't give forward looking statements. In <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> but, but I think of the company right now as just a baby company still. We're really getting started. So I would assume that in general, resale is just is a it, one of the most uh, important and common ways of transacting, whether getting consigning or uh, buying it. So I just think our whole we've really held the flag and carried the flag for the importance of sustainable consumption and uh, have been a big proponent. So I'm assuming in 10 years, it's just natural. You, I don't want new to go away, but you buy new and then you consign it. You buy resell and you reconsign it. It's a different way of thinking. It's not, uh, it's not, it becomes natural and it's not even a second thought. Right now, we still have a huge number of people that have never consigned before or bought resale. So the more we change, that and it is changing, the more the real rail flourishes and does really well. And for me personally, I mean, I'm having the time of my life. Who knows where I'll be, but uh, it's, it's really fun. It's a fun company. It's never boring. It's, it's always dynamic. So I hope I'm still part of it at some level, but you know what? The investors will decide. So <laughs> You know, every, this is the, the other axiom to everybody answers to somebody is everyone could be fired. So, you know, you have to be conscious of that. So, you know, you have you have to listen. You have to run a well run company. So I hope uh, I hope I'll be in my job. I think I will. Oh, without no doubt. And I am confident that hopefully that joy and that love of putting forward a product that you both use and enjoy and see people benefiting from on all sides of the business model is definitely going to continue. Um, so let me go to uh, the first question. And there's been a few around this, uh, which I really appreciate. Starting off, a lot of companies do not have extensive marketing budgets before they've been able to get that first investor check. What are some of the practical ideas or strategies that you were able to apply in initially getting that word out when Real Real was starting? We just, um, look, I, I launched the business with $110,000 only raised. So um, that wasn't exactly, there was no marketing budget, but we did get some press. So we use press to get people going, and um, and it did went it went viral for a really long time. We had small. We also did take you know we test five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, see if we get a return. But I would say PR is always good to get leverage, and then run small dollar tests before you expand it. Um, but look, when you start a business, the key anybody has to is like 
I have X amount of money. Again, how, what's my high order bid? And my high order bid was actually hiring salespeople to get supply. I focused on supply, supply, supply. My premise, which could have been wrong, but it wasn't, was that if I had the right supply, the buyers would start talking about it with just a little, little press. And that's exactly what happened. Oh, awesome thesis. And again, that test and learn mode really kept sort of the ability to stay tuned to the data that you needed to see to continue to make those types of investments are great. Um, the uh, um, literal uh, scenario of starting something from your kitchen table quite literally applies. Uh, and we've had a couple of people be inspired by that note and also ask sort of what was on your mind that day when you decided, yeah, I'm, I'm going to start real real, we're going to do this. Anything that you can kind of give us from your mindset of the day that you yeah. made that decision? Yeah, I mean, I remember that very clearly because I, I have this, again, I have a thesis and my thesis is when you come up with an idea that you think is big, you aren't the only one. It's like somehow we're all pulling down stuff from the universe at the same time. So, um, so I remember thinking, okay, if I've got this idea, five other people have an idea that's similar. So I better run fast, execute flawlessly and get it launched very quickly. And that's exact. So speed and quality of execution became preeminent in my head. I'm like, got to do it, got to do it, got to do it. And I, and by the way, this has never been wrong. I've like, I've always seen it's, there is like something going around that if you click on it, people thinking, there are people thinking similar ideas, you know, are worth actually not a lot. It's really <laughs> about execution. But I think um, there were probably five companies funded when we were in the resale space within months of us. And that, and again, they were at various stages of development. And that just shows that, yes, there was something in the air and you have to execute. And out of those, I think only one is still alive besides us. So, you know, execution, choosing the right battles is critical and you need to get out. If you've got a great idea, you need to get it out there fast and then figure out, was it great or were you, you know, you know, or do you need to iterate further? Uh Running a two-sided marketplace, which obviously you do, requires making key decisions almost on a day-by-day -day basis as to where the priorities lie until you get to a certain size. Um, we have a number of entrepreneurs joining us today who are either thinking or have just very early days begun that two-sided marketplace. What advice would you have for them in the establishment of a healthy, successful marketplace above and beyond just the idea of, that you shared with us on, you know, pay attention to the data that you need to, to make informed decisions. Any other tips that you can offer them? Um, I guess, I mean, again, B to C, make sure that it's gonna always be about supply or even B to B to C. So if you just think about when Open Table got started, they were all about, a, yeah, it's a great concept, but if I don't have great restaurants, no one's going to use it. So, you know, you've got to think about the great, in that case, great restaurants drove the consumer because you're changing consumer behavior. Now everyone, you know, you, I don't know many people that pick up the phone for a restaurant. Um, so, you know, it's like you, you, in almost every case it's supply. Make sure you have the supply in a two-sided marketplace and then run small tests to see if that supply is what your demand, the demand side want. The other thing which we have, which is phenomenal, and this would be the ideal, when your buyers become consigners and your consigners become buyers, then you get a network effect, which constantly drives down your cost of acquisition because you get that person once and they're playing on both sides of the marketplaces. I don't, there are very few markets like that. So if you think Lyft isn't like that or Uber, Open Table's not like that. It's not like the people who own the restaurant are gonna necessarily, maybe they eat it, use the product for eating other restaurants, but mm, chances are if you own a restaurant, you're eating in your restaurants. Um, so having that network effect, which gives you a flywheel to drive the uh, cost down is phenomenal. Half of our consigners buy mm. on the rail route and they buy a lot. And so that's just, that's an added benefit. If you can get that dynamic going, it's awesome. Then your acquisition costs will go down. Fantastic advice. Um, a number of uh, our attendees are curious, uh, given the drive and tenacity that's required to be a successful entrepreneur, how do you 
balance, if you believe in that word, or maybe find moments to breathe in like health and wellness to be able to sustain oneself through the journey of an entrepreneur. Any ideas or tips you can offer on that domain? Um, first of all, you have to understand, make the right trade-offs and be comfortable with the trade-offs you're making. So that's really critical. So if you're fighting your own trade-offs, meaning because if you start something, you'll be working 75, 80 hours a week. And if you have competing priorities, you're not going to give it your all. In fact, you're going to have guilt. It's just a bad rat haul. So that's number one, be very clear about what it will take and that it, this is a good time for you to do that. Be, go on that adventure. The other thing is I'm a big believer on exercise. There's an exercise both from a cardio level, a stress reduction level, and then a better yet, if you can get outside, be out in nature on some level. And I'm a, I love hiking. So getting out in nature and hiking is amazing for me because, you know, it sort of takes you into another realm. And uh, when you've got beautiful scenery around you, it's hard, you know, it does change your whole mindset. So I would say, eat well, exercise and make sure your priorities align. Don't fight your own self because you're going to, you ultimately will lose. And if you're too worried about, like, I know I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to disappoint these people. Um, I would have that conversation say, I need some time. I'm going to do this. It's really important. I'm not going to be there for you. I hope you're still there when I get back and figure out a way to balance it. But my bet is the first couple of years, you probably won't if it's really going well, or if it's not going well, uh, you're probably not going to be the friend, the lover, the partner that you want, you want to be long-term. So you've got to be comfortable with that. Yeah. Those are the hard but important conversations that matter, right? Because once you go down that path, it's really difficult to kind of pull back expectations around it. Um, a lot of people are curious around the idea of how to get smarter on product testing. I mean, Real Real has an amazing UX experience that I think people have passionately, myself most notably included, fallen in love with. It's so easy, it's so enjoyable. How do you, how did you create kind of early indications of like, we're going down the right path of product market fit and design? How did that drive forward the approach to what Real Real has become? All right, so this is gonna be a little, um... Uh, look, here's the thing. I thought if I get really great product that people covet, they will even, they'll jump through hoops to get it if I have like really great product that's been authenticated. So we've refined our UX and I, so I spent all the money at the beginning for a long time. Um, we had a really bad interface. We had a bad app for a while. We still have a lot of improvement because the money I spent on building up supply, building up the back end uh, of the business to make sure that A, consigners got paid well. Um, we added, you know, we automated processes. So you look at, so the truth is the only reason you're saying that, cause I would say our site, I'd give our site um, and our, probably a B minus and we're trying to become an A plus, but I'd give it a B minus <laughs> is because we have great products. So again, it's choosing your right battles because you can't do everything. It's so, de so depressing. You can't, you know, you've got limited time, limited money, limited. So you're going to choose the right battles, but, um, but we'll, we'll become an A minus company in the front end. Our app has actually gotten much better. Um, our app's now outshining the website by a long shot, but um but even then, I think we have a long way to go. But having said that, would I, if I had a dollar, I would still, which I do have a good dollar, I would still spend 60% uh, on automating the back end and automating more of authentication and using AI and machine learning and 40 cents uh, and, and also working to get more consignment in and for maybe even 65 cents there and 35 cents on the front end. I love that algorithmic approach to sort of where the value of the dollar needs to go. And, and also, I think it's, it speaks really strongly to the principles that continue to drive real, real forward. We know authenticity uh, is something that you guys really do stand for in the world. How do you feel in general the industry uh, is changing uh, with regards to that? Some people curious around, you know, is this going to continue to be a forward looking trend where there's less and less fakes on the market? Or do you continue to see that as a sort of a challenge that not just you, but anyone in consumer space needs to be mindful to address? Well, I I think it's irresponsible actually not to address it. And 
um, there's tons of fakes on Amazon. Um, and it really became apparent during COVID, I think, because people were getting uh, masks of really low quality. I mean, there's, so I would say you should be, a re as a, and they're a huge marketplace, very successful marketplace. But I think what you're hearing now from the world, um, whether it's content or it's products sold, that the platforms have to be responsible. We've always been responsible, but I'm big on, uh, you know, uh, making sure that we try do keep fakes off. I think it's my responsibility as an owner. Also, if you understand where uh, the fakes are made and the products, they're, it's really dire how they even get there. So there's a moral and ethical responsibility. We signed up from that at the beginning because um, I also honor the brands that are on the site and I don't want to sell fraudulent goods. But um, look at the scrutiny the industry's under. Look at what uh, Twitter, any media platform, Facebook, Twitter, any Instagram, but any media platform is under a lot of scrutiny for running fake news and uh, conspiracy theories, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the world wants authentic. I think they demand it. Amazon's so big and they can hide it, but even they're under a lot of duress. There was an act in Congress that's been put on hold because of the election called the Inform Act. Uh, with the sole principle of making sure that the companies that actually transact quite a bit do not sell counterfeit products. And it was really more uh, focused at large marketplaces. So you could put Alibaba in there with Amazon and uh, eBay at the larger ones, the larger peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces and our um, non uh, non-regulated marketplaces. So Congress is waking up and why are they waking up? Their constituents are yelling and worried. So I think people are tired of it. I think they're tired of getting bad products, or good, whether it's a news story or a physical product. And I, I think the tide has turned. Mm, that's really great to hear. And I, and I, and we certainly all hope that to be the case too. Um, in our remaining time that we have, it's it's crazy how close we are to the top of the hour now. A, a few questions coming in on talent, and again, I think for a lot of our founders, finding that first hire to off, to, to bring in skills that uh, support the CEO, the founder, um, is so important. That one person can make all the difference in the world, and those first few hires can really set the tone. What advice have you given founders? What advice did you even see for yourself in making sure that those first few hires were a great fit culturally, a great fit for the scale potential of the organization, and the vision of what you were trying to see with Real Real? So again, take a look at yourself. What can you do and what can't you do? I mean, I knew I needed a great merchant. I'm not a merchant. So um, the first thing I did was hire a merchant. But I have to tell you, you need people. And this is where it's really tricky. Hiring is always tricky. But you need people who are agile. You need people that are curious. You need people that get stuff done. All right. So it, one of the risks I see, um, so a lot of these, a lot of large company execs want to join startups, or maybe they they feel like, oh, it's their time. Well, they've risen to a level where they're not really doing much. <laughs> and you really need to be able to still execute and you have to execute flawlessly. So you need to hire people that know how to get stuff done and would run, especially early days, run through a wall to get that stuff done. You know, they're like, they're not going to stop. They're on a mission. They're going to make it happen. And they get, that's how they get their joy. They get their joy by setting objectives, hitting those objectives, overcoming obstacles, running as hard as they can. And they, that's the people you want by your side. Do you want them all the time? At some point, the people that really run fast and break things, maybe maybe you don't need meet them as much. You still need a little bit of that energy in the company. But at the beginning, if you can hire some people who are just like, I'm going to get this done. Because I have to tell you, especially if you're doing something innovative, nobody knows how to get stuff done. You're making it up as you go along. You've got an overarching view. You know where you want to go. But how you get there is usually hard work. You usually have obstacles. You have all kinds of things thrown in your way. So, you know, know where you're, hire people that know where they're going and then do it and no excuses and then own it and own it. People have to own, you know, their good stuff they do and their bad stuff. 
I love that. Are there any um, questions that you typically ask that you'd be willing to share of a key hire that you're looking at that, that can often tell some of those insights and perspectives that you are sharing are so important for a great hire with the company? Look, if you're hiring someone from a large company and you ask them, what did you do personally? How did you move the business? What did you talk to me about your impact on the PL? And they can't give specific examples. It means they were either managers and either they were, or they were in a political situation or they were set up in a company that didn't value accountability. So, you know, you really want to make sure, make sure that people are accountable and, and driven. Love that. All right, one last question on talent before we get to the last question for our time with Julie today. And that is this, obviously managing talent internally directly is one side, but equally managing talent or being supported to your board is the other side of the equation, especially when you're raising capital. What um, strategies or insights have you offered founders or you've applied yourself on sort of being and working beside a board uh, of directors? Well, look, um, if the, here's how I treat the board. You have to treat it very seriously because they're there to give you advice. If they have to step in and run your business, you're dead. So you're running the business, you're accountable, and your board can either can be a great sounding uh, board. They can give you really good advice, but they're not, you know, They've got other companies they sit on. They're not the ones with the vision. They're not the ones that are going to be responsible for the results. And even let's say their advice is wrong. You followed their advice and you're like, well, you told me, no, 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 that's not an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is like, listens, takes that advice, either executes against it or goes back to him. Like, I considered what you said. Here's why I'm not going that way. And here's what I'm going to do. So I think open, transparent communication, recognize the board's role, which is not to execute, but to advise and support and, and help you raise more capital, especially in different phases. But at the end of the day, um, good, clear, transparent communication between you and the board me uh, members and also setting expectations. So that's also, things always come up. You wanna make sure like, you pick up the phone, you're like, hey, this happened. I want to let you know before X, Y, and Z. Oh, such great advice. And I feel bad asking for one more piece of final great advice from Julie, but um, I'm going to do it anyway. And that is this. We, we always ask our amazing speakers to sort of reflect on what's the one thing that you'd like entrepreneurs who are joining us today to reflect on from this session? What's the last one piece of advice you want to leave us with today, Julie? If you really took this step and you're an entrepreneur, I would say... You've got everything inside of you to succeed. Don't believe your own hype. That's what, once you start believing your own press, the story you're telling the world and you believe it and you're not putting checks and balances on your own hype and your own story, yeah, just might fail. But if you if you are rigorous and you read the data and you're still then and you iterate, you're gonna be great. Uh. So here's to being great. Julie, thank you so much for the amazing insights, wisdom, words of encouragement and thoughtfulness today. We really appreciate it. Again, knowing how much you've got going on right now. Thank you. Um, on behalf of all of us at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center and everyone in attendance today, we're incredibly grateful for all of you joining us. Now last, uh, we do wanna remind you, we have started a, a big recognition around mentorship, the importance of it, the accessibility of it. Just like Julie said, we're taking a tone of responsive mentorship, not mentorship for life, but mentorship for those businesses who are in need right now. So please take a moment to recognize people that have made a difference, whether they explicitly call themselves a mentor to you or otherwise, um, you'll find details of that in our chat and we are doing a very big recognition on mentorship, the importance of it for all of us in this time. Um, from all of us here at the center, we really do thank you for joining us today. We look forward to welcoming you back soon. Um, and please do take a moment as our final ask to complete the survey in our chat. That will help us get smarter around all the work that we wanna be doing in support of you. We'd love to have you join us for our upcoming webinars. You'll see a couple coming up on November 5th and November 10th. The first one on finding alternative funding pathways for innovators, and the second one on unlocking capital through relationships. So thank you again for joining us and we'll look forward to seeing you and welcoming you all back again soon. Take care.